So I had an interesting question uh, on one of my videos I don't know, two or three days ago and the question was does my plot have any wildlife value and I was kind of a bit surprised by that question to be honest I don't really think too much about that topic although I did think about it when I initially designed the plot and the reason I don't think about it very much is because it's kind of pretty obvious to me that it has an enormous amount of wildlife value uh, just because you know when you're around the plot you see so many birds and so many butterflies and so many flying insects all the time uh, and I know the foxes love to come to the plot because I can see their paw prints uh, and they actually really love to stand on the coal frame lids and use them as a trampoline and I've kind of got the little pin prick holes on the uh, coal frame lids as evidence of that but the best evidence is actually when it's frosty or snowy and you can see all the little paw prints and stuff on those coal frame lids where they've climbed around and jumped around. Um, but it got me thinking and so I thought I'd make a quick video and just talk a little bit about what do we mean by wildlife value and what have I done, what did I do when I was initially sort of planning the plot um, and what have I done since then and I'll just talk a little bit about what Debbie's done as well and everything that I've been talking about in the connection of the allotment uh, is even more true of the back garden which is an incredible wildlife haven. I'm guessing that the questioner had kind of perhaps looked at some of my videos or photos or whatever and had seen all the plastic on the plot and you know I got all these cold frames and low tunnels on the plot over winter and obviously there's two reasons why I have those. Uh, one is because I want to have living roots in the soil at all times and because living roots produce exudates which are released into the soil and feed the soil microorganisms and so I'm really into that idea of constantly you know feeding those soil microorganisms by having living roots in the soil and the other reason is that I want to eat stuff all through winter so I've got those two, two sort of objectives. Now the, the sort of spin-off of that is that this allotment site floods really badly in winter and flooded ground is, is really not very good for the soil microorganisms. Um, most of them are aerobic, i.e. they need air, and a flooded plot has no air. And so what happens is the anaerobic bacteria start to flourish and outcompete the aerobic ones and you don't really want that as a vegetable grower. Now in my beds because they're covered they don't get all that rain and they're also raised and so they drain really well and so the advantage of that is that the um, hydration levels, water levels in, in the soil are kept at about optimum for things to grow and that includes the soil microorganisms. So from a start point I think you know the basis of wildlife value is living soils full of fungi and aerobic, bact yeah, aerobic bacteria and once you've got those things then you'll also have little you know nematodes and other microscopic worms and beetles and all those sorts of insect life in the soil and then you'll also have worms and once you've got all of those things then you'll also have birds and you know and healthy plants so that's kind of the basis of it you know have nice healthy living soils so the next thing is is the paths now i put in wood chip paths and they're arborist wood chips so they're a mix of green and brown lots of twigs in them and things like that so they're not really coarse big chunky chips um, wood chips there you know lots of little tiny bits and pieces and as a result of that they're again absolutely full of fungal and microbial and soil microorganisms there's not so many worms in the past but there's plenty of like little beetles and wood lice and all of those sorts of things and again the birds absolutely love that and you can tell that because when you come to the plot in the morning the birds have been in and they've been digging little holes all over the place and kicking the stuff around um, and I often see them on the paths you know just like digging around in there grubbing around so the birds absolutely love the paths. Now I love 
annual growing you know I, I really love the kind of sense of renewal that you get when you go take things all the way through from seed to harvest um, but I also love to have some perennials now I wanted to really try and get perennials at the sides of the plot so the pot's kind of surrounded by perennial borders and right now I've got one big perennial border that runs along the side of this polytunnel here and that's full of trees and perennial flowers uh, and some perennial kales and things like that and it's it's a beautiful border I really love it and again that's a fantastic wildlife haven and you know I let that grow fairly wild and lush so there's lots of shade and lots of places for you know frogs and toads and other things to kind of you know li live in, in the sort of damp shade and I've also got another big perennial border that runs through the center of my plot and again I've got trees and strawberries there. And, you know a lot of things really love strawberries because they completely cover and smother the ground um, and so that combination I think is really nice you know the shade from the trees and then the shade at ground level from the strawberries and then over time I'm looking to add more perennial borders I've got one really big border that's going to be the squash bed this year but over time I want to put trees in there and grow the squash in between the trees so great basically more and more perennial borders and I think over time our strategy is to do ever more perennial planting now at the moment I think between the average across the back garden the Debbie's plot and my plot I think we're about 30 percent perennial planting Debbie's plot is really focused on perennials so it's all herbs and berries and fruit trees um, and things like yacon and, and rhubarb and all of that and so you know a huge amount of perennial planting on Debbie's plot. The next thing for me has always been to get kind of pests and predators in balance and I don't really work too hard to try and keep my environment pest free and so what do I mean by that well for a start I have the polytunnel doors really wide open all the way through summer and you know I know as a result of that I'm going to get pests in here but I also get the predators in here and I have a, a huge bush at the back there that's absolutely swarming with hoverflies all the way through summer and those hoverflies are in and out of this polytunnel all the time as well as loads of bee, honeybees and bumblebees and flies and all sorts of stuff so there's masses and masses of insects in this polytunnel and I find that that just is perfect for keeping pest and predator in balance I don't really have very many flowers in here because it's full anyway of um, tomatoes you know and that's enough flowers really it just has an enormous number of um, pollinating insects in here and I do the same sort of thing outside as well so I always try and take my nets off things about July time so I do net because of birds pigeons uh, mainly and you know early stage uh, attacks by pests but pretty soon as I said by about July I take the nets off and I basically manage just by inspection and and uh, BT spraying BT occasionally but I don't really generally do that very often maybe once or twice um, and that's a very selective uh, organic uh, pesticide it only really kills caterpillars so it's it's pretty good and I say what I'm looking for there is the balance between pest and predator if I had everything under nets all the time then what I found is that I often trap the pests under the nets and the predators can't get into the nets to get at those pests so by having the nets off from July then I, I tend to find everything just works in balance so even outside although we don't tend to plant flowers just for the sake of flowers and we didn't do that because on our allotment site the council had one a rule that says that you could only grow edible flowers basically and um, you know not that many edible flowers that you can grow we do grow them nasturtiums and things like that um, but uh, you know our focus has been on um, flower but uh, growing fruits and of course you know all the fruits have loads of flowers and so the plot is full of flowers it's full of flowers from the tomatoes and the peppers and the courgettes and the squash and the apple trees and the cherry trees and the pear trees yeah and it just goes on and on and on and I love to leave some of my um, perennial um, alliums to go to seed as well and they just yeah they just look so lovely I suppose the final thing is that I accept some losses I expect some losses from pests and birds 
and I don't generally worry about it unless those losses are impacting our ability to feed ourselves. I mean, at the end of the day, my primary objective is to feed us, but you know, I'm quite happy to let the birds have their share. And that's even the case with mice and things. We do lose a bit, a little bit and stuff to mice, but generally I don't really worry about it. I only worry about it when, again, they're really impacting our food supply. And that did happen recently where the mice just really got a taste for ochre tubers and they were just really going into my ochre tubers like crazy. And I don't just actually think the ochre tubers are very good for the mice either. So, um, you know, they, they, I, I did find a few dead mice that looked stuffed on ochre tubers, so I didn't mind trapping them. Um, and you don't really have to trap very many before they get the idea and, and, um, and depart. So in, in the end, I think I only had to trap two. Uh, mice in the I don't know five years that I've had this allotment site, so I don't think that's too bad. Um, but there's plenty of evidence of mice, you know, digging around and uh, pulling up the odd bean and things like that, and they do show sure love um, peas as well. But they've never really impacted on the crops, so you know, I'm, as I say, I'm happy to let them have their share. And in autumn, we let uh, quite a few ap apples drop, and we don't clear those up. We let the birds eat those apples as well. And over winter, we don't generally net all of our brassicas. Again, we leave a few brassicas just for the birds to nibble away at. And we don't get huge flocks of pigeons coming in and decimating the crop or anything like that. So it's generally, you know, a pretty, um, pretty cooperative arrangement that we have here with the, <laughs> with the animals. So I really enjoyed uh, just kind of mulling over this, um, this question. And, you know, it just comforted me, I think, having thought it through that to some extent by design, but mostly by luck. Uh, you know, we've got a pretty wildlife friendly environment here and it's certainly better than the farmer's field that it was before. And I think that, you know, one of the other things is perhaps the plot is the question was thinking, well, this plot's really tidy. Now, I must admit, I do quite like a tidy plot, but um, although it's tidy, and although I use a bed system where I plant little one meter square, uh, effectively monocultures, it's, you know, we grow 250 varieties uh, and we grow many different successions of those varieties. And so, although it might be 250 square meters of monoculture, it's 250 different monocultures <laughs> effectively. Um, and so it's incredibly diverse in terms of the range of different things that we grow. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, if you looked at any 250 square meters of space and saw 250 things growing there, you wouldn't really think of that as a monoculture, although each square meter kind of like is that. Although increasingly I'm doing a lot more interplanting. So each square meter probably has at least two different things growing there. And over a year, I generally do three successions. So every square meter has six different things growing in it every year. That's actually one of the reasons why it's pretty impossible for me to do uh, any kind of strict crop rotation. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this quick video. My name's Steve, this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel, and I'll see you soon.